Thank you, Sue, so much for reading for us. Please do keep that uh, passage open in front of you. May I add my warm welcome? I see lots of people returning to visit us after a while away, and uh, it's lovely to see you this morning. I hope we'll have a chance to say hello at the uh, end of our meeting and after the evacuation activities. If you head out of the door by Monty there, you will go straight up onto the roof, and uh, then you will be probably... Uh, burnt with everybody else. So I suggest you don't go through that, that door, um, and we use that door. There's a, there's, a, there's a door to Monty's left, our right, uh, which I think was what we were supposed to be thinking about. Let's pray, shall we? The unfolding of your word brings light. We pray, our Father in heaven, that you would uh, lighten our darkness, grant us wisdom and understanding so that we ca- may live rightly in the world, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now, on what grounds do we have hope today, and how should we act in the light of it? The human desire for a golden age of equality, justice, prosperity, and peace is as timeless as it is universal, and our longings for stability and dreams and hopes appear to be hard, hard-wired within us human beings, whether it's strong and stable with Teresa or the politics of hope with Jeremy or time for change with Barack or things can only get better with Tony, we all seem to long for this golden future. Some, however, would argue that those who do preach about their dreams of a better world are at least open to the accusation of naive sentimentalism even unscrupulous optimism. Uh, Roger Scruton is one of the foremost philosophers of our age, whatever you make of him, he certainly should be accorded that title as a foremost philosopher. And he wrote a book a number of years ago in 2010 entitled The Uses of Pessimism and the Danger of False Hope. His argument was that the greatest harm and havoc has been wrought in history by those who've presented themselves as optimists, either on the left or the right, either religious or secular. And he warned against what he called unscrupulous optimism and the politics of hope. Those who believe in the perfectibility of humanity as they pursue their utopian ideals, optimists as they are, whether left or right, religious or secular, finding themselves unable to realize their dreams Scruton observes, go to greater and greater extremes in order to bring their impossible vision into being. And so he warns us of the relentless zeal of the secular ideologue who is equally intolerant of the heretic as any religious zealot. Bigotry, totalitarianism, secularist extremism is as brutal as that of the fundamentalist fanatic. Interesting, just recently when I was on what has rather unkindly been termed my gap year in Australia over a couple of months in the autumn. I bumped into, without realizing who he was, a former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, who's a very keen Christian and was at something we were at. And he, um, without uh, me grasping who I was speaking to, encouraged me to read this book, What's Happened to the University, by Frank Ferradi. I'd strongly encourage you, if you think about these things, to read it. Ferredi speaks about the growth of identity politics, what he calls the weaponization of emotion, the politicization of language, and this great desire to create a safe space in which uh, we can be free to live um, without uh, any fear. And then he identifies something called microaggression, which has been pinpointed in our universities, such that the way I speak, regardless of my intent, if it causes you to feel uncomfortable, is to be uh, undermined and not allowed. Uh, So that the, the idea of whether I can say something or not becomes entirely subjective. It depends on how you feel about what I'm saying, rather than any truth or objective reality in what I'm saying. And uh, this explains, I think, the religious zeal with which many are pursuing that kind of desire to create safe spaces. Yes, a great optimism and a desire to have a world that is uh, free and um, fair and uh, equality and justice and prosperity and so forth, but a relentless zeal to wipe out 
any um, damage and danger uh, that we find done to ourselves. Does this suspicion, then, of optimism mean that we should, we should abandon all hope of a better future? <laughs> all this can leave us rather doubtful of seeking any better existence or any hope at all. And thus, realism gives, can give way to cynicism. And I want to suggest that it need not. That the Bible does hold out for us a proper vision of the future, a golden age, that takes seriously both human imperfectibility and hope. And this golden age is first anticipated right back in the Garden of Eden, is then promised to Abraham. This golden age is realized in part in the land of Israel and is exhibited perhaps more than anywhere else before the coming of the Lord Jesus in the reign of King Solomon, which we're looking at here in the early chapters of 2 Chronicles. Just turn the page to chapter 9, and verses 7 and 8. Here is the Queen of Sheba, a foreign queen, speaking of the age which came into being under King Solomon. She gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great quantity of spices, verse 8. But she said to the king in verse, sorry, that's verse 9, in verse 7, Happy are your wives, happy are these your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on his throne as king for the Lord your God. And then over the page in verse 22, King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom, and all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into them his mind. So then, between 970 and 931 BC, there was, says our author, an end to austerity, a period of strength and stability. Hopes were realized, and these great dreams of humanity for a golden age, came into being under King Solomon for this brief period of around about 40 years. And our author, writing in 450 BC, 500 years later, looks back to King Solomon, and he is saying to the people who are reading it in his day, look, what is necessary if we are going to see this golden age of hopes and dreams realized? And what I want us to do th this morning is to look ultimately at just one verse, and that is to do with the people's response. It comes in chapter 7 and verse 14. There was a slight muddle with our readings this morning, not our reader's fault at all. I'm afraid it was my communication. But verse 14 of chapter 7, where God says to Solomon, if my people who are called by ne my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So one part of the realization of this golden age has to do with the response of God's people. And that's where we're going to end up. A response of humbling ourselves, of prayer, of seeking the Lord, and of turning from wickedness. And we'll come to that at the end. Before we get to there, however, I need to do a little bit of a recap on what should have been our main theme last week. And for those of you who were here last week, you may have realized that we got slightly sidetracked. I walked away from Sunday morning thinking we, uh, I had made a complete hash of things, which is what preachers sometimes do. And therefore, we can't really get to verse four, 14 rather, until we put back in place what should have been our major emphasis last week. So what we should have seen last week, if I'd been about my business properly, is first of all that the golden age is realized through God's covenant love towards his chosen king. And secondly, that this golden age for which Christians long is realized through God's merciful presence amongst his people. These two core aspects are absolutely foundational to the reign of King David and King Solomon and to the whole Bible story. So in the closing part of Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple, in chapter 7, uh, 6 verse 41 through to chapter 7 verse 3, what we find the author doing is 
using his editorial scissors, if you like, cutting and pasting, and including material that you don't find in other accounts of the dedication of the, 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 the temple in the Bible. So we've got the one king's account, and what we have in chapter 7, verse 41, 6, verse 41 to 7, verse 3, simply isn't there. Now, as I look at it and read it now to you, you will notice the major emphasis that the author is focused on. Verse 41 of chapter 6. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and your saints rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. And here it is. Remember your steadfast love for David, your servant. Now, that's unique to 2 Chronicles. You won't find it elsewhere. Now look at chapter 7, verse 1. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and sacrifices. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests couldn't enter the house of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord filling the temple. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, here it is again, He is good and his steadfast love endures forever. And then in chapter 7, verse 4, through to verse 6, again, unique, this one statement at the end of verse 6. The priests stood at their posts, they played their music, and then they gave thanks to the Lord, saying, His steadfast love endures forever. So now, do you see what our author has done? The way to make sense of what he considers to be the major theme is to look carefully at his editorial work. And the editorial work he has done is to emphasize the steadfast love, the covenant commitment of God to King David, his royal reader. On what, his royal leader, on what basis then is this universally cherished goal of humanity, a golden age, how is it ever going to be achieved? our chronicler tells us, in 450 BC, on the basis only of God's commitment, covenant, love, to have a royal ruler reigning on the throne. Because God is unfailingly committed to his promise of steadfast love towards his king and their people, there is hope. Now, I hope that encourages you, even now as we think about it, you know, you look at the newspaper, you see what's going on in Europe, you look at the radical changes going on in our culture at the moment through many people who I would suggest have this unscrupulous optimism of which Roger Scruton speaks, and you say to yourself, the sands seem to be shifting absolutely everywhere. What hope is there? Precisely the same there was in 450 BC. The steadfast love of the Lord, which never ceases, expressed towards his chosen royal ruler, King David, King Solomon, and the, the, then the one in Solomon's line. And what is fascinating, and I haven't got time to go into it in detail now, what is fascinating throughout the account is that our author omits, or omits any reference to Moses. So if you were to take the one king's equivalent passage and this passage, there's tremendous reference to Moses. Our author cuts that completely. And so what he seems to be saying is, look, let's focus all the hopes of the people of God on King David, King Solomon, and a king after their line. And then, as we read through the rest of chapter 7, verses 1 to 10, look at the way Solomon is center stage. Verse 5. King Solomon offered as a sacrifice. He's presiding over the sacrificial system. Chapter 7, verse 7, and Solomon Kent consecrated the middle of the court. He is presiding over the consecration of the most holy place. And look at chapter 7, verse 8. Solomon held the feast for seven days and an additional eighth day. It's King Solomon who is presiding over the feast of dedication. And then in chapter 7, verse 11, then Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and his own house he successfully accomplished, then the Lord appeared to Solomon 
in the middle of that. Solomon, 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 Solomon. On what grounds are we to have hope, says the author to his readers in 430, 40, 50 BC, whenever it was? On the basis of God's steadfast love to his chosen king in the line of King David and King Solomon. That's the grounds for hope. Unshifting, unfailing. So interesting to me, I don't know if you've ever read the Lamentations of Jeremiah. He wrote his Lamentations when Jerusalem was utterly destroyed, torn piece from piece, um, uh, about a hundred years before this was written. Right in the middle of the description of the pillage, the rape, the ethnic cleansing, and all the rest of it, Jeremiah gives one course, one word of hope. What is it? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. So running through this exilic period, this period of uh, God's judgment, there is hope, there is hope, there is hope resting in the chosen king. It's interesting, isn't it? When people hold out optimistic hope for us, it's always, um, well, most frequently focused up in a particular leader, whether it's Donald Trump for a certain significant percentage of the United States of America or Monsieur Macron for a very significant percentage of the whole of Europe by look of it, whether it's uh, the potential of Jeremy or, well... Maybe it's uh, the disappointment at the once potential of Teresa. It's always focused up in a particular person. And God seems to be saying here to the people of God in 450 BC, yep, you're right to focus up your hope in a particular person, but the particular person is my chosen king. And my steadfast love towards my king, my covenant for him, is unfailing. But there's a second emphasis not only the covenant love of God towards the king, the golden age of King David and King Solomon was also realized on the basis of God's merciful presence in the temple. And that's our second emphasis, which is summarized for us. Well, it's in the long prayer of Solomon that we had read, and then summarized for us again in chapter 7, verse 12, and chapter 7, verse 16. So have those verses before you. Chapter 7, verse 12. The Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Now look at verse 16. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be with you for all time. So what was it that brought about this golden age in 950 BC? Oh, the merciful presence of God in his temple. And so this dream and our longings for the golden age, says the chronicler, are only possible in God's world as God himself is present amongst his people and God is present amongst his people as sacrifices made for sin and as his people turn to him in prayer. Now, you would have thought that having God present amongst his people is an absolute no-brainer if the golden age is going to be realized. Of course, if there's to be a golden age in God's world, God has got to be amongst his people. I was getting off a train just the other day. It was the beginning of holidays, Friday night, Thursday night, sometime like that, and there were three or four kids um, coming down the platform to greet Dad, who had arrived home for the summer holidays. I was pretty much knocked over by them. They were belting down because Dad was here. Now the holidays can begin. The idea of having their summer holidays, do you see? And of course, without God present amongst his people, there can be no golden age. And so the temple is designated as a place of sacrifice for sin and a place of prayer to the God who is present amongst his people, full of grace and mercy. And the author makes very little reference to the purpose of sacrifice. He does record the degree of sacrifice. And Solomon's sacrifice there in chapter 4 is massive, with 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. Some writers suggest that surely this must be an exaggeration. 
God's presence in his temple is enabled as God himself makes provision for our human failure, the golden age was only achieved as God himself dwelt amongst his people. Not only is the temple a place of sacrifice, also God is present in his temple, and therefore he is attentive to the cries of his people. The temple is a place of prayer and access to God and access to God's mercy and God's forgiveness. One writer puts it like this, because God's presence indwells his temple, so God's temple is a place of his attention and of his compassion. Look at chapter 7, verse 16 again, and the way it's put there. It's so beautifully described. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house, that my name may be there forever. What does it look like to have God's name there? My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. His attention, his compassion. And you can see that running right the way through Solomon's prayer. As time and time again, he says to the Lord, listen from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear forgive. Then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your people. Hear in heaven and forgive the sins of your people. So the temple is this great place of sacrifice, and it's also this great place of prayer. As human failure, our rebellion against God, our inability to, uh, to live the way God wishes us to live, is recognized, and God in his mercy forgives and dwells, dwells amongst his people. And so, as God's people come, come to his temple, whilst it's a scene of extraordinary power and awesome glory, with the description of God descending on the temple, at the same time, it is a scene of hope and kindness and restoration and forgiveness as sacrifice is made for sin. Well, there is our revision, what we should have done last week, and I'm sorry we've had to go over it again, hopefully with slightly more success. God's rule guaranteed through the steadfast love of God towards his king. God's presence enabled on the basis of sacrifice. And therefore the Christian vision is the vision of a realist. It takes seriously our human failure. And God makes provision for our human failure. He knows that we're going to fall short. He knows that we will cross the line. He knows that we will transgress. He knows that we rebel against him, that sin is an ever-present reality in our lives. And in his grace and in his goodness, he provides this place of sacrifice and of prayer so that under the rule of his covenant, of his uh, king, to whom he is committed in covenant love, we can draw near to God. The Christian grasps then that what we hope for is only possible as God dwells amongst us in mercy and grace. We don't airbrush out imperfectibility. And God in himself, in his grace, mercifully holds out the possibility of forgiveness and acceptance and a fresh start. And any vision, any optimistic hope that does not take really seriously and make provision for our human failure and our human sin is simply a pipe dream, a sentimentalist, naive, wishful thinking. One of the um, pieces of cultural education I received in Australia was to watch the film The Castle. Now, I don't know if there are any Australians here. Apparently, it is absolutely kind of central to a sense of cultural identity in Australia. And this guy has his house right next to an airport. It's worth watching. It's a great film. Has his house right next to an airport. And the airport are trying to expand and uh, take over his house. And endless people come to try and buy him out, but this is his castle, and he's not going to move from it. And as one after another after another person comes to him and offers him sums of money for his house, he responds to them, tell them they're dreaming. Tell them they're dreaming. And any person who comes to us and offers us a vision of some future hope without taking seriously the need for help from outside the presence of God and the reality of our human imperfectibility, 
is simply a pipe dream. Tell them they're dreaming. Now, I know for some of you this will be tantamount to heresy, but uh, when Mrs. Thatcher died, they obviously had any number of uh, um, anecdotes about her time in office. And I remember Norman Tebbit coming on and saying this. She genuinely believed that the wholesale release of capital would open the floodgates of philanthropy. Isn't that interesting? She genuinely believed the wholesale release of capital would open the floodgates of philanthropy. She somehow believed that the good in humanity would outweigh the evil. Tell her she's dreaming. It didn't, did it? It opened the floodgates of greed. And anybody who comes, whether left or right, without taking seriously the imperfectibility of humanity, tell them they're dreaming. It's just a pipe dream. It's sentimental nonsense. And Roger Scruton is absolutely right when he says the uses of pessimism and the danger of false hope. Ultimately, it's extraordinarily dangerous because if you have this vision of a utopia and you don't take seriously the reality of human sin, and imperfectibility, you will push it and push it and push it and push it, driving out anybody who disagrees with you with a totalitarian zeal. What a different vision we have with the Christian gospel. A recognition of our imperfectibility, a recognition of human sin, the recognition of a God who loves us and is committed to us from the very opening stages of the Bible, this glorious hope of a future a commitment, a covenant commitment through thick and thin to the king of his choice from the line of David and Solomon. And then the provision of sacrifice for sin and the reality of his presence amongst us. No wonder then when the, gospel, when the gospels begin and open the account of King Jesus' birth amongst us, they are full of praise and thanksgiving. Mary, magnified the Lord. Elizabeth praised God. The heavenly host gave glory to the Lord. Zechariah gave thanks to God. The shepherds glorified God. Simeon blessed God. Anna worshipped God because here was the realization of this great hope which we see prefigured in 950 and then spoken of here in 450 and realized in King Jesus the one who is the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham and our forefathers forever. And what do we find Jesus doing? There in the temple. And what do we find Jesus doing? There in the garden of Gethsemane, praying, interceding for his people like King Solomon before him. And what do we find Jesus doing? There on the cross, in his steadfast commitment love to his people, dying to cleanse us from our sin. And what do we find Jesus doing? Raised from the dead, enthroned in heaven over God's glorious golden age for his people forever. There's one thing which we've left out if this golden age is going to be realized. And it's there in Solomon's prayer and then in the conclusion to this section in chapter 7 verses 11 through to the end of the chapter, we find the chronicler including again. This is another piece of editorial work by the chronicler. You won't find it back in 1 Kings. It's unique to the chronicler, and it's there in verse 14. This is what he wants the people of God to do. People often ask me about application. Oh, we must have application. You must give us application. Well, we've had quite a bit of application already. Realize that any hope for a golden age without God and without forgiveness is a pipe dream. You're dreaming. Now, here's the application at the end. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their iniquity. So the prospect of God's golden age is not dead in 450 BC. How is it to be realized? Oh, through God's steadfast love and through God's merciful presence, sacrifice of a sin, prayer. But what is our part in it? Humble yourself. Pray. Seek the Lord. 
term. One writer has described this as one of the finest expositions of repentance in the Bible. What does it actually look like? Jesus comes, doesn't he, saying, repent, turn. But what does it actually look like to repent? Humble yourself, pray, seek, turn. Another author says of these verses that they shape the expectation of the rest of two chronicles. And we're going to find ourselves over the next three weeks drilling down into various explanations of what it actually looks like to humble yourself, to pray, to seek his face, and to turn from wickedness. Hezekiah, he turned to the Lord in prayer. Asa, he sought the face of the Lord. Uh, Jehoshaphat, he turned together with all of the people. That's what it actually looks like. So we'll be unpacking it over the next few weeks and we'll drill down into one or another. But to humble myself is to recognize and acknowledge my absolute dependence upon God. To stop trying to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. To stop trying to turn over a new leaf or a New Year's resolution. To come back to the Lord in humility, I surrender. I failed. It's amazing, isn't it, how the Sermon on the Mount begins. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who come to the Lord and say, look, living God, I can't do it in my own strength. I humble myself before you. To humble yourself is to turn from striding out into God's world in my own strength as an independent agent. What a difficult thing to do in wealthy, prosperous 21st century London. It gets easier the more the Lord brings us to our knees. And maybe that might be necessary. Humble yourself. It is to hand over the sword, as it were. I surrender. Prayer for the author of Chronicles is the fundamental means by which God's people receive God's blessing. It's always talking to God. It's never listening to God. You know prayer in the Bible is never listening to God. No, prayer is always speaking to God. You do not listen to God in prayer. You listen to God in the Bible from his word. And prayer is the fundamental means by which we humanly access all that the Lord Jesus has achieved for us. And so when Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, we come to him in prayer. And when Jesus says, ask, seek, knock, he's commanding us to pray. Prayer begins as we acknowledge God, our Father in heaven. Prayer begins as we seek God's first, seek God's priority first. Prayer begins as we confess our sin, forgive us our sins, as we forgive the sins of others. And to seek God is to engage in a wholehearted pursuit of God and his cause. So when we're told to seek God, we're not just being given another plate to spin. Oh, I've got to bring up the children. Yeah, I've got to get the house sorted. I've got to plan the summer holidays. I've got to make sure my job's all right. Oh, yeah, and I better seek God as well. No, Jesus says, seek first his kingdom. And so this golden age is accessed, is realized, yes, provided by God through his steadfast love, towards his king, through his provision of sacrifice, but accessed as we humble ourselves, as we turn to him in prayer, as we set our sights first and foremost on him and his kingdom and his honor and his will. And again and again, we're going to find an active engagement in everything that God loves, seeking God in the rest of two chronicles and a deliberate distancing of self from everything God hates. And that's where verse 14 finishes. Turn from their wicked way. And we'll see plenty example of that over the next few weeks. Now, it is possible, isn't it, from, from time to time to be overwhelmed by pessimism. Is it just because I'm getting older? <laughs> you'll probably say yes. But as you get older, you've seen optimists over and over and over again. You've heard the politics of hope 
850 million times. You've had one person saying things can only get better and another person saying we'll release capital and that will produce philanthropy everywhere. And it's possible to become more and more pessimistic. And then as one begins to see long-held desires and long-held norms of a culture turned on their head by the new generation coming through, it's possible to feel that one is at completely at sea, as no doubt the Chronicler's original audience did. I'm sure they did in 450 BC. Where is hope to be found? Yeah, there is hope. As we recognize God's steadfast love, as we acknowledge that he has provided sacrifice for sin and is access through prayer, and then as we humble ourselves, as we turn to him in prayer, as we seek him and his kingdom first, and as we turn from our wickedness. Well, now, we're going to have this fire drill in just a moment. Some of you are going to end up on the roof if you follow the original instructions. Well, good luck to you. But uh, I wonder if during the fire drill, we could ask one another, what grounds for hope have you got in your life? What, gra what grounds for hope? Do they take seriously human imperfectibility? Do you actually take seriously imperfectibility of human nature? Or are you just a naive sentimentalist? You're just dreaming. What grounds have you for hope? Does your grounds for hope take seriously human imperfectibility? And if your grounds for hope are in the solid assurance of the steadfast love of the Lord towards his covenant king, sacrifice for sin, the possibility of repentance and faith, what are you doing about it? Ask that in the nicest possible way, but how is that impacting your life? And if it is impacting your life such that you are humbling yourself, turning to the Lord in prayer, seeking his kingdom, turning from wickedness, you are on really solid ground, no matter what else might be going on around you. Let me lead us in prayer. When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. We praise you, our Father in heaven, that the Lord Jesus has made a complete and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. We thank you that he now intercedes for his people. And so we ask that you would graciously cause us to humble ourselves before King Jesus, to turn to him in prayer, to seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and to turn from wickedness. And we ask it in his name. Amen.